I am Kat Golden. I am a brewer at O'Fallon Brewery. With a name like Kat Golden, you have two options when you grow up. <laughs> you either get a really cool career like brewing beer, or you become a stripper. <laughs> Obviously, I chose option number one. I think that was a wise move. Um, but you know, this hasn't been my only career. Actually, I'm extremely excited to be here tonight because I, in my former life, used to be a teacher. I was. Uh, I taught advanced placement, English, uh, literature, and composition to high school seniors. Clearly, they drove me to drink. Um, so, I got the best of both worlds tonight. I get to teach you guys about our beer. There are no hall passes. There are no parent-teacher conferences. There's no Moby Dick. There's just drinking beer with you guys, and it just doesn't get any better than that. So um, let's talk a little bit about how everything started. So back when I was early in my teaching career, something pretty exciting was happening in O'Fallon, Missouri. Uh, and that was obviously the opening of O'Fallon Brewery. So Tony and Fran Caradonna had actually owned the first craft beer distributorship in St. Louis. So we have them to thank for what we're doing here tonight. Um, they sold their distributorship to major brands and decided that they would open a brewery. So that ended up being what today is O'Fallon Brewery. This happened in January of 2000. So right at the turn of the millennium. What a perfect time for a new beginning, right? And then, so they started out with just the two of them doing everything. They're brewing the beer, they're managing everything, so they're dealing with the sales, they're dealing with the marketing, uh, they're dealing with all the TTB compliance stuff. Um, they are even distributing the beer. So they're loading up the van and they're carting it around. So they're doing everything. This worked for about two years until they had grown so much that they just couldn't keep up with it anymore. So that is when Brian Owens, Brian say hello, <laughs> Brian Owens, our head brewer, um, came on board. So that was 2002. And by the way, I just need to stop for a second and tell you something. Uh, Brian Owens taught me everything I know about brewing beer. So I'm very indebted to him. Having, here, having him here tonight, watching me do this, is a bit like me feeling like Luke Walker, or Skywalker, rather. Um, and Brian is my Yoda. So I have Yoda over here telling me, you know, you can do this. And I'm like, I'll try. I'll try. He's like, there is no try. There is only do or do not. So that's what we're doing. We're doing this tonight. Um, so anyway, so Brian joins the team in 2002. Um, up to this point, they had only been brewing one beer, O'Fallon Gold. That was it. Brian joins and then the portfolio starts to expand. We're going to talk about some of those beers tonight and some new ones that have happened in the recent past as well. So 2002 to 2011, Fran and Tony own the brewery and are running things. And then they decide in 2011 to sell the brewery. And so they sold it to a man named Jim Gorzica. Jim Gorzica had worked for AB, and this was shortly after the buyout had occurred, and he decided that he wanted a new project. So he was going to move on to smaller and better things. Um, and so he bought the brewery, and he's been the owner since. And now we've got a greater period of growth. So much so that we have to open a new brewery because we just cannot handle the capacity anymore. So, um, we currently have a new facility that is in the works. It's actually um, being uh, basically gutted and, and totally retrofitted in everything as we speak. Um, so, in April of this next year, April of 2015, we're hoping to have all the new production um, happening in, <laughs> oh yeah. You get, a, you get a sneak preview. The new production um, will be happening in April, we're hoping, the production of the beer. And then the grand opening to the public, we're hoping, will take place in May. And of course, you know, we're at the mercy of, of everyone else, of all the, the contractors and, and the people who are manufacturing the equipment and shipping it to us and, and installing everything. So that's our goal. 
we're ho hoping that it'll end up uh, actually being the case. It'll come to fruition at that time, but that's our current plan. Um, currently, we have a 15 barrel, actually it's 20 barrel brew house, and we brew 15 barrel batches of beer at a time. Uh, if we do a double, we can, we can do uh, 30 barrels in one of our 30 barrel fermenters. Uh, this guy right here, we're gonna have 50 barrel brew house. Um, when we finish our first year in the brewery, we are aiming at 15,000 barrels a year. And then once we reach maximum capacity, if we were to max out everything we could possibly do at this new facility, we would be up to 50,000 barrels a year. All of this started with Fran and Tony Caradonna, who had this great idea and they started small, and here we are. So we're super excited. Um, we are currently the second biggest craft brewery in, oh, the hemp, thank you. We are the second biggest craft brewery uh, in St. Louis. Am I right on that, Brian, right behind Schlafly? Right behind Schlafly in terms of production. Um, so, soon we will be in our new digs at uh, Westport area. Maryland Heights, right off of 270 on Progress Parkway. So follow us on Twitter, um, follow us on, on Facebook, on our website, and keep up with what's going on, and certainly we will let you know how we're growing and uh, what our new, our new uh, I guess, the latest and greatest news is on that. Questions about anything I've just said? All right, sweet. So let's move on to this first beer. This first beer, Hemp Pop Rye is actually very near and dear to my heart. And I will tell you about that later if we have time. Just make sure to remind me. Uh, so Hemp Hop Rye. Hemp Hop Rye is 5.5% ABV. Um, Brian was asked to develop a recipe specifically to showcase a very special ingredient. Anybody want to take a stab at what that special ingredient is? Yes. Hemp. Hemp, hemp seed. Yes, exactly. Um, and we will talk about hemp in just a few minutes. But, uh, but before we, we do that, let's talk a little bit about um, what we might find in this beer. So we've, we're showcasing the hemp seed. We're also showcasing rye. However, we don't want the qualities of the rye to overpower the hemp seed. So before I go on and start to talk about what those qualities might be, I'm interested to hear what you're getting out of this beer. Take a, take a sniff. And then take a sip. What do you get? Anything. What, 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 does, what does hemp seed taste like to you? Someone said hemp seed. It tastes like hemp smells. It tastes like hemp smells. Okay, hey, that's not a bad thing. Um, what what else? What else do you get? I get grass. I always do. Grass? Yeah. Not well. No, not that kind of grass. Um, again, something we'll talk about later. But <clears throat> so yeah, no. Um, when you think about hemp seed. Have you ever chewed on hemp seed? It's toasted hemp seed is actually what we use. We use 50 pounds of toasted hemp seed in the mash. Generally, you get kind of a nutty, earthy quality, you know, like you would with most seeds. Um, so you're going to get a little bit of that. But what happens is if you start to over hop a beer that has hemp seed in it, then it's going to overshadow that earthy, nutty quality that we really wanted to showcase that Brian was focusing on. So it's called Hemp Hop Rye, not because it's one of those big palate wrecker uh, hoppy beers, but because we wanted the hemp and the hops to play together in this beer so that the, the hops would really help push forward and accentuate um, the hemp seed and not overpower it and also play with the rye as well. Um, hops and hemp, of course, are part of the same family. So, rye. Anybody know just from past experience what rye is going to give you in a beer? Yeah. To me, it's, it's uh, usually, it's not a strong flavor, but it's very pronounced, but it's kind of dry. Okay, dry. I could see how you would use that as a descriptor. Sure. Anything else? I always think about rye as being a little spicy. It has a little kick to it. Now, this is only 12% rye. 
rye in our grain bill, again, because we didn't want to overpower the hemp seed. So everything was about focusing on the hemp seed. Um, this beer that you have here was just recently recognized, I guess it was earlier this year, um, by Livestrong as being one of the 18 most healthful beers in the United States. Um, so you can feel good about what you're drinking. You're like, yeah, one in each hand. I'm getting healthy. Um, so, and it's because of all the health properties that are found in hemp seed. Um, vitamin E, it's loaded with vitamin E. It's supposed to help fight disease. Um, it's also supposed to be good for lowering blood pressure. Um, <laughs> see, this is, this is getting better and better. Um, it's loaded with fiber. That's a good thing. Um, also, I think it's supposed to be good for your eyesight. So there, it's now kind of, a lot of people are touting it as a superfood. There are not a lot of hemp beers out there in production. I only know of a couple off the top of my head other than ours. So I'm pretty proud of, of the fact that we are one of the few who has decided to make a beer like this. Um, other interesting facts about hemp. You know, it's kind of funny. This beer gets a lot of attention at festivals. Anybody want to take a stab at why? <laughs> right. Be what is closely to. Exactly. You know, there are 2,000, there are over 2,000 different varieties um, of plants in the cannabis family. And 90%, actually over 90% of them produce only harmless, uh, like, products. So hemp seed, hemp seed oil, um, hemp rope, you know, material fiber. Um, and, you know, you know, the United States is actually the only industrialized nation in the world that does not differentiate amongst any of those varieties, which is why you're not supposed to grow hemp in the United States. Now, there's, of course, this huge battle about that right now. Some of the, of the states have said, you know, they're thumbing their nose at that. Kentucky just recently passed a law that allows them to grow hemp. However, the United States says, good luck, we're not going to let you get any seeds in that are not sterilized. So, um, you know, there's this big battle that's going on now, um, but there are so many wonderful things that can come out of hemp production. Uh, we get our hemp seeds from Canada. They are all tested batch by batch to make sure that there is no THC in them. So at festivals, we always get the, am I going to pass my drug test at work? Am I going to get kicked out of the military? Um, I can't drink that beer. I want everyone but the one with the big pot leaf on it, please. Um, well, it's, it's actually a hemp leaf. But anyway, so it gets a lot of excitement and attention. Um, but you will not have any problems passing your drug test. Some other interesting little factoids about hemp. Um, despite the fact that the United States is so reluctant to welcome hemp growing in, in now, um, you know, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, hemp growers. Also brewed their own beer, too. Awesome. Um, Declaration of Independence, drafted on hemp fiber paper. The first Levi Strauss jeans were made of hemp. In 1942, there was a huge, you know, the whole war effort in production of things that would be helpful in winning the war. They actually, the United States government made a, <laughs> made a film called Hemp for Victory. Um, can, you, can you imagine that? 1942, and now we're like, no, no, hemp's bad. So anyway, um, hopefully things will be changing in that direction sometime soon. Thank you, Zeeks. Questions about hemp hop right now? The, the IBUs... I want to make sure that I get it dead on here. Um, 25. And our SRM is 10. Yeah? Has the formula for this beer changed in the past year or so? It's more balanced to me than it was. You think? Hmm. That's interesting. You know, one thing that can really affect hop, or rather um, beer flavor, are the hops that you get. And even if you get the same, if you're using the exact same hop, okay, let's say it's Chinook. You're using Chinook. Then you get in a new batch of Chinook, new farm, new alpha, new whatever. It can affect the flavor of the beer. So, um, you know, obviously we want to aim for consistency. I'm glad that you think that it's even more balanced now. That's awesome. Um, and proven is good. But, you know, that is one thing that you always have to kind of consider is we always aim for consistency. But there are little nuances that can change the flavor of beer. Um, and that, I think that that's one 
one thing that makes craft beer so cool is it's not just you push a button and it's going to be the same every single time. You have to work to make things consistent. You have to work to make things improve, and um, and it's, it's it rests on us. You know, it rests on the brewers and the ingredients that we're using. So, um, thanks for telling me that. That's that's kind of a cool comment. Anything else about hemp hop? All right, cool. Well, let's move on to Zeke's. Um, Zeke's is a pretty new beer to us. We actually started producing this last spring. Uh, it's actually one of our beers that we're now producing year-round, so it's become one of our year-round offerings. Before I tell you anything more about it, I'd like you to tell me what you are getting in this aroma. Impress me. Tell me the hops. Bam! Who was, who was that person? Jaina, that wasn't you, was it? <laughs> Galaxy, brilliant. Um, how were you able to recognize that it's Galaxy? What did you, what did you get? From Schlafly, yeah, it very much is. Absolutely. We're, we're starting to pour the third beer, and I really want all of you guys to wait until she's talking about it to try this because I am so excited about this beer that I, I just want to see it all go down at one time. That's all. Awesome. Okay, sorry. I'll be, I'll move along. You're fine. Okay. No, no early sips. That's all I'm saying. Okay. okay. Plus, plus, I will say something about that third beer that's being poured. You don't want to sip it right now because it's too cold. Um, you won't get any of the flavors that I'll be talking about with this beer. So you want to like nestle it, cradle it, treat it like a little baby for a bit, and then we'll get to it. Um, so back to Zeke's. So yeah, you're gonna get those. Um, the Galaxy hops that you that you find here are gonna really punch you with the with the passion fruit, um, tropical flavors, definitely a little pineapple, and of course some citrus as well. Galaxy hops, um, they actually originated in Australia, so they, they've been around since 1994. They're a hybrid hop that was created there, but they actually have not been very popular here in the U.S. until the past like maybe five to seven years. They've really become uh, popular. They're not a very easy hop variety to get a hold of, so we're very lucky to have gotten what we need in order to continue making this beer. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the history here. So I told you that our owner is Jim Gorzica. His brother, Tom Gorzica, is the vice president of sales for O'Fallon. And for years he's been saying, really would love to have you guys make a pale ale. Let's make a pale ale. Let's do an American pale ale. Pale ale, pale ale. So finally, we said, all right, let's do it. Let's make the pale ale. Um, and we started thinking about, well, of course, his name is Gorzika. Gorzika. Zeke was his childhood nickname. And because we were making this beer, because he's just really been passionate about doing that, we named it in his honor. So that is why it is Zeke's Pale Ale. Um, so we decided we wanted to make it a beer that would showcase two of our favorite things. One, our favorite malt, hands down, is honey malt. We love it. Um, we love the sweetness that it gives to, to a beer, and so we wanted to include that in this beer. And the second thing we wanted to do was we wanted to showcase one particular hop variety, but we weren't, weren't sure which one yet. So Brian came to all of us and said, all right, quick, seven different varieties of hops that you love, that you think could really be perfect for creating a single hop pale ale. We were super excited, and of course we're rattling off these awesome ones, and of course Galaxy is one of them. And he said, okay, let's start pilots. And we did. And uh, what we found was that Galaxy is so beautiful for flavor and aroma, not so great for bittering. But we didn't want to give up on Galaxy entirely, so what we decided to do was use a little magnum for bittering. We do that right at the beginning of the boil, and then bam. Right at the end of the boil, this is called burst hopping. You throw in those hops, so five minutes before the end of the boil, we throw in a bunch of galaxy, and then right at the end of the boil, a bunch of galaxy, and then we dry hop it with galaxy as well. So that is why you get all of those tropical aromas and flavors in this beer. And we think that it's balanced out pretty well um, with the honey malt. So a lot of times, um, you know, you can have a pale ale, or an IPA that is just a little bit too, um, maybe too astringent or a little too in your face and you want something a bit more balanced, 
Zeke's is, I think, one that's more balanced, and that honey malt, I think, really helps with that. Because it's only 5.1% ABV, you can have more than one of them and not feel like you're going to have trouble, you know, staggering your way out of the bar. So um, we're really pleased with the way this one turned out. Do you have any questions about about Zeke's? Yeah. IBUs. IBUs. All right. Apparently, I'm going to need to be uh, telling you guys this for sure. Um, let me. I've got it written on my little cheat sheet here. Uh, so 29 IBUs and seven yeah. SRM. You would expect more, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what's interesting about IBUs, and I'm sure I'm preaching the choir here, but you know, you could have a beer that has an astronomical off the chart number of IBUs, but depending on what your malt bill is, it's going to make, you can have a beer, a beer that's 100, 100 IBUs, but then it's very smooth tasting on your palate. It's, you know, or you could have something that's lower and you want a hoppy pop. And so just again, depending on your malt that you're using and the gravity of your beer, um, then that can obviously affect the way your palate is interpreting those uh, those hop flavors. So that was yeah, that was a great question. Yeah. Um, everybody here may not know what is SRM. What um, uh, standard reference method. So basically, it's the color of the beer. Um, the the color of the beer can range from very 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 pale. I'm sure you've seen some that are like almost the color of pale straw. Um, like a Pilsner is obviously pale, uh, American adjunct lager, you know, lighter colored, all the way up to the deepest, darkest Russian imperial stout that pours like STP motor oil, right? Um, and so that's what SRM is, yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, are we doing all right on, on our timing here? Fantastic. All right, this beer is another exciting one. Gosh, they all excite me. Ah, so, um, yeah, King Louis Toffee Stout. How many of you have had this beer yet? Yeah, that's why, because we just kegged it last week. <laughs> um, and the one person, the one person in the house, other than Brian and me, who has had this beer, is also employed at O'Fallon. Hi, Jaina. Hi, uh, yeah. So, you don't count. Um, all right, so let, let's talk a little bit about this beer and how it came to fruition. It's been almost a year in the making, actually. This beer is something that we've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, we have collaborated with Dave Owens, no relation to Brian, but friends. Okay, maybe distant, right, but friends. Um, Dave Owens is the head chocolatier at Bissinger's. You've heard of Bissinger's? Yeah, Bissinger's. What kind of beer am I calling this guy? Baby this is a baby-making beer. <laughs> oh, it is. It is. Cradle it. Cradle it. Love it. It'll, it'll open up to you. Cradle it. Um, okay, so. So, um, Bissinger's Chocolatier. You know, for those of you who don't know the history of Bissinger's, man, it's old. When I say it's old, I mean 1668. King Louis XIV commissioned Bissinger's as the Confesseur Imperial of France. Okay, down through the generations. This chocolatier is still going, still going, still going. Eventually one of the descendants said, I'm going to take this company, I'm going to move it, I'm going to open a place in St. Louis, and that is how we have Bissinger's. I believe it was open in 1927. Um, so whenever you have Bissinger's chocolates, there's, there's a huge history there, a very long history. Um, so, anyway, yeah, 1668, 1668. King Louis XIV, you know, the Sun King, that one. So, um, anyway, so back to Dave Owens from Bissinger's. So he has, he's actually collaborated with us on some other beers. Uh, have you ever had our cocoa latte that we did at one point? Couple, I'm seeing some nods. Uh, yeah, it was a nice, it was a nice uh, coffee and chocolatey, awesome, yumminess um, and you know and it was it was a one-off type thing I think we we did it for a short time and then we you know we've kind of put it aside and maybe we'll come back to it I'd love to um, but he he collaborated with us on the uh, on the cocoa on that so we decided that we wanted to do something else with him we decided we wanted to make a stout 
We wanted to make one that wasn't too overly roasty that it would overpower any wonderful something something that he comes up with recipe wise. So in talking about what, what would we do with that, um, Brian said, how about a toffee? Of course, instantly we were all like, yeah, let's do a toffee. So he talked to Dave Owens and Dave said, yeah, okay, here's what I'll do. Because they don't have like an in-house toffee that they do. Um, they, he said, I will make a proprietary toffee just for O'Fallon to use in this beer. Sold. Yes, please. So they, they did. Um, in fact, he came up with multiple recipes and we started the pilots. And oh, did we start the pilots on this beer. Uh, by the way, before I forget, I should tell you um, the, all the vital stats before Daniel asks me. So, let me rewind. Vital stats. Oatmeal stout, 6.3%. 26 IBUs, 45 SRM. Okay, stats out of the way. Back to the story. So we're, um, so we're brewing these pilots. We brewed our first two. One of them we did with this, oh my gosh, it was like Heath, like imagine Heath Bar, except in a beer. Um, imagine all this Heath Bar goodness. And we put that into this beer. And we did another one with like a, a Belgian dark candy sugar that had a similar aroma, but we just thought, hey, we'll play with it. We'll see what happens. So we brewed these pilots. The brewery itself is not exactly the best climate controlled place if you're wanting to ferment a small amount of beer. So we have these two, uh, these two little fermentation tanks, which you basically, you know, glorified home brewing, which is what you do when you're piloting a beer. They go underneath my desk in the office. <laughs> I thought all was well. I was wrong. Next morning, because I'm always there crazy early, like, you know, five o'clock in the morning. I'm still half asleep. I open up the door to the brewery, unlock the door, I walk in and I think, damn, it smells good in here. And then suddenly I realized, oh crap. I turn on the lights, it was everywhere. Caramel explosion. All over the walls, all over the floor, it had like, it had hit, it had exploded so, with so much force, it had hit the bottom of the desk, the underside of the desk, and it knocked all of my stuff off the desk. It had flown, like staplers were across the room. I'm like, good God, I'm glad I wasn't there. I'd probably be missing a leg now. Um, but anyway, so and it smelled wonderful. We were, of course, all sad, because all the work that we'd put into these two pilots was gone. But there was sludge on some of my papers on the desk. And so everybody that would come in, as they would come into the room, I'm like, smell that sludge on this paper. We've got it. We can do this. This is going to be an awesome beer. So um, the sludge on the paper became our inspiration. This is what we're going to do to have, um, to use this toffee, uh, to go that route of being like the real deal toffee instead of going candy sugar. Um, and this is what we ended up with. So all these pilots came into this beer. Um, Bissinger's has just opened a new location, actually, downtown. Help me out, Brian. Do you know the general area? North Broadway. North Broadway. And they're giving tours? They're just starting. They're, they're just starting to give tours. So um, you should definitely swing by and try some of their chocolates. and Or actually, you should bring some of the chocolates home and pair them with King Louis. Uh, the other day, I did some of that. We did a little pairing experiment at the brewery. I was like, hmm, what chocolate do I have lying around? Kit Kat. So I'm like, look, everybody, Kit Kat, Kit Kat, King Louis. Oh, man, yeah. Get you some Kit Kats. And they about to go on sale after Halloween. So load up on them, bring them in, and be drinking your King Louis and chowing down on the Kit Kats, got to say. So, um, so one other thing that's kind of fun, some little secret ingredient that we got going on here that makes it not only local, St. Louis local, but local a little bit further out in Fenton, Missouri. There is a, there's a company that makes, they have a patented process for cold press Madagascar vanilla. So they bring in, they import in these beans and they have this special process that, that extracts the vanilla 
um, with the wonderful vanilla flavors without any astringency, absolutely none at all, no bitterness, nothing. It's so smooth. And so we decided that we would accentuate the caramel flavors in this beer with this cold pressed Madagascar vanilla. So what you get is essentially toffee and vanilla, which is perfect for toffee because obviously that's an essential component of toffee. But then there's no chocolate in this beer. Zero. How do you get this chocolate? It's the malt. Exactly. One of the key malts here is Dehust Carafa 1. So you're going to get a roastier flavor with no bitterness. Have you ever had a stout? I mean, it may be a delicious stout, but have you ever had a stout that's really bitter? Have you? Um, we didn't want that with this beer. Because if you have a really bitter stout, that toffee is gone. You're, I mean, that's all you'd get is just, you'd get that bitter, roasty, um, coffee kind of flavor in that stout. So we tried to subdue that um, quite a bit by adding uh, the, the Dehus Carafa. So that was really one of the malts um, that helped us out here in achieving that nice balance of sweetness uh, that allows the toffee to shine through. Um, questions? Yes? Um, Lou was saying earlier that he wanted this to be warmer. What uh -huh. would you say is the optimal temperature? Okay, I think the optimal temperature is going to be 50 to 55. Um, you know, like you would do with many of your bigger beers. What's interesting, of course, is that it's not a bigger beer. I mean, it's, what, 6'3". So, but just the fact that the style itself, I think, and the fact that we've got the toffee here, it lends itself to being opened up. So that's why I said, you know, cradle it. If you've still got a little bit left in your glass, set that aside and come back to it a little later. You're going to see it open up. You're going to have a lot more toffee aroma. You're going to have a lot more uh, of the vanilla coming out. Um, so, yeah, stick it aside if you can. Just so you know, almost all their I checked the temperatures. Oh, they thanks. almost all come out at 55. Okay. So it's right there. Okay, then, you know, if, if you feel like you're not getting enough of those flavors that you're, that you're looking for, that we're, we've been talking about, then maybe maybe warm it up a little bit more until you feel like you're right there. I mean, you know, every beer has a perfect temperature. And, and it's, you know, you read these things that say, based on style, you should serve a barley wine at blah. Based on style, you should serve, you know, really it's personal preference and what's coming out to you and your palate. For me, I love a good cold, cold, cold IPA. And some people say, no, I, you know, I want it to warm up a little bit. So really what I would say is, you know, experiment a little bit, take a sip now, um, see what you get. And then, you know, let it sit for a while, and uh, I think you'll find it's kind of fun to see how this, how this will open up to you. Yeah. Other questions? Is this seasonal? Is that, is that what? Seasonal. Is it seasonal? Um, is King Louis seasonal? That's a great question. So, as I said, we just kegged it last week. It's just now hitting the market. Um, right here at Cicero's is one of the only places that has it yet. So. Yeah. Right here at Cicero's is one of the only places where you're going to get this beer. So, um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty special. We're super excited that you guys wanted to bring it in tonight. Um, and you guys are the first group of people that we have even introduced, <laughs> introduced this, this beer to. Um, in fact, Brian and I have a meeting with our wholesalers, with, uh, with our distributor um, in the county tomorrow. And you know what? They haven't even been introduced to this beer. So you guys, sneak preview, baby. Um, what's that? Reference? Awesome. You'd be our reference. Sweet. Thanks. Come talk to me. Um, so anyway, yeah, Jaina. Wait, no, seasonal. I feel got to go back to this seasonal. So it was just released, um, and we are thinking we'll probably run it through February. Is that the current plan? February. You can find it not only on draft, but you can find it in bottles. Um, I know that there are shops that have got it in now. Um, so definitely stalk your usual places, and you should be able to find some. Um, the, there's only one issue with making this beer in terms of like, you know, we would love to make this beer a lot and often. But every time that we go back to Dave Owens at Bissinger's and say, hey, you know, 
we just did another batch or you know we just finished that other, that other batch we were going to do and we've got more orders we need a hundred pounds more of toffee by next week right um i mean again this is not something that they normally do this is something they're doing just for us so it's kind of hard for us to do that there's a delicate balance between saying yeah you know, lots of people want this beer, and Dave Owens, we need more toffee. Yeah, 100 pounds, 100 pounds of toffee in every batch of this beer. Oh, and how, how it works. So this beer, basically what we do when we are brewing in this process, when we are loudering, we're transferring the wort from the kettle, I mean, um, from the mash tun into the kettle. We extract uh, several barrels of this wort into a large mixing tank. Imagine KitchenAid on steroids. Okay, that's what we have. So we get some of that wort in and then we just start dumping in the chunks of toffee, the chunks that I don't eat. Um, and we put them in and we start stirring. Okay, stirring and stir. Can you imagine what the brewery smells like at this point? Imagine beer smell. You've all smelled it. I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. When, you know, the mash and the boil. Imagine that and toffee merged, the love child. Um, yeah, toffee love child. So, except not that beer, no, uh, this beer. So anyway, it's absolutely delicious. Uh, the smell is absolutely delicious. And then we transfer that right back into the kettle and then we boil it. So again, that's, that's how we get those flavors there. So yeah, it's seasonal, but um, we're hoping that we can keep it through February. It's just that, as I said, that delicate balance. So go buy it. Stock up. Hoard. Um, Jaina, you had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to know what happened to the pilot batch after the lemon exploded under your head. <laughs> you are so mean. <coughs> I dropped it <laughs> on the ground and it shattered <laughs> all over my Converse All-Stars. And they've never been the same since. Um, yeah, there was there was sludge all over the other one, uh, the other carboy, and I didn't realize there was sludge on the bottom as well. And so I picked it up because we were going to move it out of the office because we didn't want we didn't want another explosion in the office. So instead, we were just going to put it in the lab. Um, so we put it in there, and um, right as I was lowering it down to put it onto the ground, uh, it was about maybe an inch from the ground my hand hit some of the sludge and it slipped and it just crashed so yeah that was and it cut me too so sacrifices for beer man so yeah that's the story on the other one thank beer right here he did brian how old <laughs> okay so um yeah and i'm we'll, we'll call you out on your age so how how old were you you were young how old were you when you designed this recipe he was 24 years old. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, they actually designed this beer specifically to compete. They wanted something that they thought would really stand out, and so they said, "We are going to brew a smoked porter." A smoked porter, Daniel. That is 6% ABV, 24 IBUs, and 29 SRM. So. That was the plan. We're going to brew this beer specifically for this competition. And they did, but they were also mindful of the fact that not everyone's palate really goes for smoke. You know, some people, for example, with, with scotch versus bourbon, some people don't like scotch because they don't like that smoky, peaty flavor. Um, some people don't like smoked beers. And so they were thinking, okay, well, this is not just something we want to compete with. We want to be able to sell it as well. Um, to, you know, your typical consumer. Uh, this is 2004. Some palettes were not as refined, maybe, as now. So they dialed back a little bit on the smoke, on that, uh, that smoked malt, the Bamberg smoked malt that comes straight from Germany. Uh, dialed back a little bit, sent it in for competition in 2003. All the judges' comments were the same. Beautiful beer, not enough smoke flavor. So, what they did was they went back to the drawing board and they said, all right, fine, we'll just take the smoked malt and we will double it. So you have a 63, I believe, percent. 63 percent of the grain bill here is Bamberg smoked malt. They submitted it again, 2004 GABF, bam, won the gold medal. Um, 
So it's it's definitely seriously smoked, uh, for sure. Um, you know, I would say this is a, this is a beautiful beer. I, we don't do it on on draft uh, at this point. I am hoping that we will do that at the new facility. Um, we only bottle this beer. So you won't ever find it on draft here, at least not for now. But you can find bottles. Um, and it's just called Smoke. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Oh yes, food pairings. I think that we are the perfect city. This is the newest entry into our Brewer Stash series. Brewer Stash series for us allows us to be creative. Think of new things that we want to try that we may or may not ever do again. So the beer that you've just gotten is um, our Imperial Pumpkin Wheat Wine. We may or may not ever do it again. I sure as heck hope we will because I love this beer. And I'm not even a huge pumpkin beer fan. Um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to do something to play on the popularity of our pumpkin beer. Because we, we sell a lot of pumpkin and we know that a lot of people in St. Louis love our pumpkin beer. So we've never done anything, we've never changed our pumpkin beer. Um, although you always hear from year to year, you know, year to year, especially with, uh, with pumpkin beers in general, like, did you change this? Or, no. It's the same beer. We've never done anything different with it. We decided, though, that we wanted to do something fun this year with it, and so we did. We took the exact same spice profile. So cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves. Uh, we actually drive down to the spice shop in St. Charles, and the lady who runs the spice shop always knows to get together all the spices for us and bags them up. Um, we take the cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves, um, and we actually create a spice tea out of them, like you probably do around Christmas time. A lot of you probably make wassail or spice teas of some kind. We actually have like a cauldron uh, made from an old keg because that's what you do in craft breweries. You rig everything with old kegs um, on a turkey fryer. Uh, I, you know what? You're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. That's what you do. So anyway, um, so we created this spiced tea with the cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves. Just hot water and tea um, type situation. And we let it cool. We put it into the bright tank before we carbonate the beer. We transfer our finished beer into the bright tank. Um, and that is how these spices get into the beer. So there's no spices in the boil, none of that. But we actually do it on the finished beer. Um, Something that differentiates our pumpkin beer and the Imperial pumpkin beer from many other pumpkins, actually two somethings. Um, one is that we don't have some of the other pumpkin spices that you might encounter with pumpkin pie. Um, a lot of places will put ginger in, and some of you have probably had some pumpkin beers and you say, that's ginger. Um, and we also don't use allspice. That's another very popular spice that you'll find in, in uh, pumpkin and sweet potato pies. Um, but we don't use that. We just stick with those same three spices. Something else that we do that's very special is that we use 100% natural, real pumpkin in this beer. Um, in both our regular pumpkin and our imperial pumpkin. So again, some pumpkin beers, there's just spices that create that profile. We actually use pumpkin. Um, we use over 100 pounds of pumpkin in our regular pumpkin beer 